People have the option to watch a service like Sling TV or Hulu with Live TV that create a streaming product for cable. They tend to still watch on their TV screen. The phone, the tablet, the computer, there's viewing happening there, but it's a fraction of what you see on the big screen. Hey gang, it's Monday, June 14th. Ross and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, a new marketer podcast made possible by VTEX. I'm Marcus, and today I'm joined by our senior analyst who covers TV and video, it's Ross Benish. Hey Marcus. Hey chap, thanks for joining today's fact. The drive-in concept was first popularized by a Texas chain of eateries called The Pig Stand. Who's first, do you know what that is, Ross? Is that like a, a company that Americans know about? I'm not familiar with The Pig Stand. Okay. Their first drive-in opened on a highway connecting Dallas and Fort Worth in 1921. You'd pull into the parking lot and be greeted by waiter or bus boys, waiter bus boys, who served burgers and fries on trays that clipped onto the car's window. In 1931, an LA franchise of the chain began to let car owners order and received bagged meals from a single window. Interestingly, McDonald's, their first drive through was installed in a restaurant based in Sierra Vista, Arizona, located near the Fort Huachuca military installation. Uh, military rules forbade the soldiers from wearing their military uniforms in public, and they weren't about to change into civilian clothes to grab a burger and run back to the base. So the restaurant manager, David Rich, decided to cut a hole in the wall so members of the military could pick up their orders without stepping out of the car cut a hole it seems a bit drastic why don't you just not take the meal to there no just smash the just take the wall down today qsr magazine reports that mcdonald's generates 65 percent of its u.s sales from drive-through customers two-thirds of all of all mcdonald's sales come through from their drive-through i know what you're thinking ross marcus you've had a productive day well you'd be wrong i spent way too much time reading about drive-throughs this morning hey drive-throughs are, are handy during covid so handy they're too handy I don't have a car, ever. so I haven't been to one, but I'm, I'm sure they were handy for other people. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to. I did cycle up to a few in the last couple of months and you get a weird look like, should you be should you get yourself four wheels and then come back? Uh, anyway, today's real topic is TV still king. So, Ross, are TV ads still king? Jason Mander of GWI explains why he thinks they still might be. He notes that the average global consumer now watches TV for just under two hours a day, a decline of about 25 minutes compared to the early 2010s or 2010s. But broadcast TV still accounts for more time than any other entertainment behavior, he says, and continues to post very high figures in some key demographics. So I went and looked at our time spent watching TV numbers for Americans and noted, uh, so two things, Ross. One, the average American spends two hours and 50, five zero minutes a day watching TV. And two, older folks watch a lot more TV than that. 45 to 54 year olds, three and a half hours a day. The age group above that, 55 to 64, four and a half hours. And the age group, group above that, the over 65s, was five and a half hours a day watching TV. What are your thoughts on these time spent watching TV numbers and how they're changing? Well, during COVID, they changed and they increased. We were having time spent with TV decline year after year for the last several years. Mm. But then in 2020, we saw a bump because people were stuck at home. But that bump was like almost entirely driven by people ages 45 and up. And, and especially those age 65 and up. They just watched a lot more TV than they were in previous years. Now that things are getting back to normal, our forecast is going closer to where it was in like 2019 which is a drop from last year. And we expect that drop to keep happening, but it's still a very sticky medium, especially for older demographics who are, who are watching three plus hours a day. But when you look at people like under 40, the time spent is dropping off and it's a fraction of what it is for older people. And we're talking about, when we say watching TV- we're Linear about, TV, yep. Right, right, linear TV content, okay. Yeah, not streaming, so that's a whole right. different thing. Right, so- TV, watching traditional TV content going forward, the time spent overall is going back down a bit again. Yeah, but not drastically. You know, it's dropping like five to 10 minutes one year and the same, you know, it'll drop another five to 10 minutes the next year for, for the whole US population. When you break it down by age demo, um, you're seeing the majority spent with people over 45 years old. 
Right, right. Yeah, so, so total, yeah, 250, 2 hours and 50 minutes this year, 240 next year, 230 the year after that. That's total, as you said, the older folks is not going down much at all. However, college age kids is such a huge discrepancy. College age kids spend just an hour a day watching TV compared to over 65s who watch five and a half hours a day. This information includes multitasking too, to keep in mind too. So college kids are spending an hour per day. They're also probably like on TikTok or something on their phone while they're right. doing it. So it's not, it's not exclusively, that time spent isn't exclusive to TV if you have a second screen or something. You yeah, know? it's a great point. And, and talking about doing other things, using other devices uh, whilst you're watching TV. In terms of TV viewers, every, oh, this is also it's so interesting. So in terms of people who watch TV, even though college age kids only watch an hour a day, and you can argue, you know, you can question how engaged they are during that hour. But in terms of TV viewers, every age category, even college age kids, has over 70% of that population, of that age category population, watching some TV. So of the 18 to 24 year olds, of the 25 to 35 year olds, of the over 65 year olds, all of those age categories, over 70% of the population watching. The over 40, anyone over the age of 45, those age categories are close to 90%. Um, what is changing is the device on which they watch live broadcast TV. The GWI article notes that globally, the traditional TV set remains the top choice, 64%. Just over half of consumers globally are using alternative devices, though. 33% will use a, a mobile phone, 25% a computer, 11% a tablet to watch live broadcast TV. Ross, these shares are global, but thinking about y the US, would you expect the makeup to be similar and how might you see that changing? I expect the makeup to be pretty similar. The TV screen, whether it's a smart TV or, you know, an, an older TV, it, it remains the, the popular way to view it. Even when people have the option to watch, you know, a service like Sling TV or Hulu with Live TV that create a, a streaming product for cable, they tend to still watch on their TV screen. The phone, the tablet, the computer, uh, there's viewing happening there, but it, it's a fraction of what you see on the big screen. People prefer to sit back, relax, and you know, watch it on a giant screen. When, mm -hmm. when they're watching on a phone or a computer, it's usually because they're at work or, or on the go. It's not the like go-to device for most people. Right. And that viewership that's happening on the computer, my, anecdotally, my own personal experience, when I'm watching you know, like a, some kind of uh, streaming TV service, like a YouTube TV, a Sling TV, I want to watch it on the TV because to your point, it's near the couch and it's more comfortable. But those services, sometimes the, the playback, the rewinds, the, the pause functions, fast forward, all that stuff, it, sometimes it just doesn't work as well. And so I do find myself using the computer because it's easier to control the pause functionality. But that's only going to improve as you know, 5G comes, comes of age. So the TV is where most people want to. And if there's other viewership happening, it's more so maybe because the TV just isn't providing the right experience yet. Yeah. And there's also, um, you know, the TV everywhere stuff where if you have a pay TV login to something like Verizon or, or Spectrum and you want to watch an app on your computer um, using your credentials, uh, you can do that. And, and it does seem like some of those pay TV apps can be pretty clunky when they're yeah. on a smart TV, like they'll just freeze or they'll have issues. But if I watch them on my Chrome browser on my desktop, I don't have as many snafus. Yeah. Yeah, the other way people seem to be watching, at least from what I've seen personally, people watching TV on, especially sports, something where you don't need the volume high on their computer or on a smartphone even, is when you want to watch two things at once. Uh, yeah. So my dad is like a perfect example of this. He'll have, you know, an NFL game on the TV. He'll have uh, maybe a baseball game on the laptop or, and then maybe he's watching some basketball on the tablet. That's too many things to try and keep track of. I don't care what he says, but there is definitely a, a fair amount of multi-screening when it comes to using these other devices to watch things. Let's talk about ads on TV, Ross. So when it comes to favorability scores across ad formats, TV ranks number one across all age categories, according to GWI's February 2021 research on US and UK folks. TV beat email, social, and internet ads. TV even scored highest amongst consumers who avoid ads and consumers who feel represented in ads. All of those different demographic groups, TV came out on top. Is one survey, but Ross, why do you think that is? People are accustomed to TV commercials. These other ad formats are a little newer and it takes some time for people to get used to them. And mm -hmm. um, there's also a lot more 
tracking and retargeting with those other ad formats you mentioned. That's why advertisers like them because they say there they're may be less waste and they can be precision, but they also irritate people when you're retargeted online for a product you just purchased. You know, when you're watching a national broadcast of a TV thing, everyone seeing the same ad, you know, you're not getting retargeted in, in such a regressive way. Yeah. One reason notes that GWI research from February, one reason could be because folks think that TV ads entertain. They're more entertaining. They're, some of the words associated with TV ads were memorable, entertaining, funny, more so than inform, which those other formats do more so, according to this research. Inform would be words like helpful, informative, relevant. So email was the most informative format, followed by internet ads and social ads. TV was the only one of the four that that was more entertainment heavy. What do you make of this finding? Do you think there's something to be said for just entertaining people and not trying to be as relevant, as informative, as help, quote unquote, helpful? Well, TV ads are a lot more expensive to produce. I mean, you, you, there's obviously the Super Bowl examples, but even throughout the year, you'll see brands dropping millions of dollars for a single ad spot to feature a celebrity. And, and it may be highly produced in a way that it looks almost like a small movie. Mm -hmm. Whereas like an email is just going to have like a display page or some text. Social ads can have a video component, but they usually don't have such lavish production values. So, yeah. you know, because in a social ad too, they're probably making a hundred different iterations of that same ad and targeting it out differently. Whereas the TV ad, if Geico goes and films a, a highly produced spot, they're going to run in a big sporting event. They're investing a lot. In that mm -hmm. ad. And I think that's one of the reasons why they pop out a little more. And of course, they repurpose that. I mean, if they're going to spend that money on that TV ad, they're going to probably put it on YouTube and, and, and elsewhere online. But without TV, they wouldn't be putting that much production value into it. Ads that run only on streaming services are TV like, but I, I still don't think they quite have the, the very expensive creative that you see with like marquee TV events. Right. Yeah, you mentioned Geico and, and, and plenty of others investing in, in those TV ads, uh, and that has translated into a lot of ad dollars for TV. For quite some time, I went and looked at our forecast for US TV ad spending. This number just is probably one of the most staggering numbers that I think I found myself kind of coming back to and still being surprised every time I look at it uh, over the last however many years I've been working at this company. TV ad spending, 2012, 2012 which was, what was that, nine years ago? was $65 billion. In 2025, it will be $65 billion. So nine years ago, it was $65 billion, And in four years time in the future, it will be $65 billion. So over that stretch, 2012 to 2025, 13 year stretch, it stays at $65 billion. Now there's some ups and some downs. 2019 went up to 71. 2020 went down to 61. 2021, it bounces back to 66. So there's some fluctuation, but by and large, it lives TV ad spending has lived at 65 billion, basically would have been close to for a decade and a half going back and then going forward into the future. Ross, your thoughts on the resilience of TV ad spending in the US? Well, even with cord cutting and the erosion of viewership, TV networks have continually raised their ad prices and advertisers have agreed to do that. So advertisers still find TV to be valuable enough, particularly for reach that they will keep spending at a similar level even when the viewership declines year over year because right now they don't see anywhere else to get that much reach with 30 second video spots. Mm -hmm. Streaming is rising, but streaming has smaller ad loads and most streaming time spent doesn't happen with ads. It's on you know ad-free services like Netflix. So marketers still have TV built into their media plans and I don't see that changing in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only number that does change over that time span for TV is that its share of total media ad spending. And that's just because digital's, digital exploded. In 2012, 39% of ad dollars were went to TV. And in 2025, it will be 17% of ad dollars. So from 39 to 17. But as we mentioned, the, the total dollars just haven't budged at all. And that's it for the first half time now for the half time report where we summarize the key takeaways from the lead story in 30 seconds. Ross, what would you say uh, is your one or two takeaways from the first half? My takeaway would be that time spent with TV is pretty resilient and that even though it has declined in recent years, 
Linear TV still has more time spent with it than digital video has in the US. Yeah, an excellent point. Uh, that's it for the lead story. It's time now for in other news, but first a quick word from our sponsor, Vtex. Retail's next competitive threat may come from a business model or channel that didn't even exist a few months ago. This modern dynamic requires companies to adapt quickly, pivoting business seemingly overnight, something traditional commerce platforms just can't support. There's a new enterprise commerce platform on the rise, one that's fast, flexible, and doesn't require nine months and a million dollars to get up and running. Go to vtexvtex.com slash emarketer to learn more. All right, folks, we are back today in other news. Paramount Plus just introduced a new ad-supported plan. How much time do people spend streaming video on subscription-based services versus ad-supported ones? And how expensive is too expensive when it comes to streaming video? Story one. Paramount Plus just introduced a new ad-supported plan for $5 a month. Paramount Plus Essential, as it's being called, is just half the price of the premium $10 offering, but you will have to give up local news and sports coverage, and you won't be able to access offline downloads or 4K streaming on certain titles. The new $5 ad-supported tier replaces an older $6 option that was carried over when the service rebranded from CBS All Access. Ross, how do you see folks reacting to this new tier? Well, it's, it's kind of a bummer that the new tier won't have the local stations. It's so yeah. hard to stream local television. And uh, you can use something like Lowcast, but it's on tenuous legal ground as a nonprofit. So I, I think most consumers will be fine with it, but it just makes it harder to access local content. Yeah. Yeah. The newly released ad supported version of HBO Max, they have kind of similar distinction between its ad supported and ad free tiers, the offline downloads and 4K stuff. Insider intelligence analyst Daniel Carnahan notes that in Q1, Viacom CBS reported 6 million new streaming subscribers driven by Paramount Plus, bringing its total count of global streaming subscribers to 36 million. Viacom CBS has a goal of reaching between 65 to 75 million paid global subs by 2024, as in three years' time. Story two. Tim Peterson of Digiday notes that of the time people spent streaming video in 2020, 62% was spent on subscription-based services versus 32% on ad-supported ones, suggests a PwC survey of over 1,000 US adults. Todd Supley, partner at PwC, thinks the reason for the gap may not be as simple as folks preferring to watch movies and shows without ads, but rather the fact that there are a lot more subscription-based platforms than ad-supported ones. But now, Ross, as you well know, there's Peacock, Discovery Plus, HBO Max, and Paramount Plus, both with ads, as we just noted. Ross, your thoughts on this split between, was it 60-30, between subscription-based and ad-supported services? The split aligns with other data I've seen from Nielsen and Comscore showing that the majority happens in ad-free services. And I think a big part of the reason is that the services that don't have ads, like Netflix, Prime Video, and Disney Plus, are superior services in the eyes of most consumers compared to the ones that do have ads. Yeah, a few points here. In 2020, PwC research said the typical person used on average nearly eight streaming services, including free ones, compared to six in 2019. So from six to eight. Also, Nielsen report from January found 34% of US households used an ad-supported streaming service. That's up six points from the year before, January 2020. And PwC found 63% of people would be willing, two thirds of people would be willing to sit through more ads if it meant lower prices. What's unclear, says Mr. Peterson of Digiday, is how many more ads they're willing to sit through. Story three, an increase in price was the number one reason by a long shot that Americans would cancel their streaming subscription service, according to December YouGov research. Netflix bumped up their prices a touch in February of this year. They also had a much slower Q1 than expected, but that's likely due to things like people going back outside more and Netflix having pulled forward all of those new 2021 subscribers into 2020 as people stayed home. Netflix customers who said they would be willing to pay more than they currently do rose from 47% in December 2019 to 55% six months later in 
May 2020 from 47 to 55, according to Cohen and Company. And those who stream over seven hours a week of Netflix content, their willingness to pay more rose from 52% to 60% from December to May over those six months. Ross, where's the ceiling? Where's the ceiling in terms of how much are w- people are willing to pay? Depends on what the streaming service is. For something like Netflix that has really low churn levels, I think you could up that by 3 or $4 and still be just fine with most consumers. Something like Apple TV Plus or Stars that has really high churn levels, just a dollar or two on a service that's already cheap is going to drive most of them away. Yeah. ESPN Plus, they raised their yearly plan by 10 bucks. Uh, yearly plan to $60 a year, 6 0 for 2021. Yet subscriber numbers have continued to climb. Ipsos found that two thirds of Americans spend uh, less than $50 a month for paid streaming video services. That's all we've got time for. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Ross for joining us today. Thanks, Marcus. A huge thank you to everyone listening, of course. A thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. Uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow, hopefully, for the Behind the Numbers Daily, the marketer podcast made possible by VTEX. Mm-hmm.